Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Highlights from the Hill. I'm your co-host, Jim Cousins. Today, we're doing something a little different. My co-host, Superintendent, Dr. Carol Cavanaugh, will be having a discussion with three teachers who are currently in the Hopkinton school system. And these teachers actually grew up in Hopkinton and went through the school system, graduating in the 90s and 2000s. They're going to be having a conversation talking about how things were, how things are, what's different, and what remains the same. We hope you enjoy. I'm here this afternoon with the assistant principal at the high school, Josh Hanna, a first grade teacher at Marathon Elementary School, Jen Kane, and a high school chemistry teacher, Connor Zanini. And you're probably wondering what all three of these people have in common, and their common trait is that they are all graduates of Hopkinton High School, as well as current educators in the school mm -hmm. department. Um, and I've asked them to be here today because I think that they can share with us a historical lens. Mm -hmm. What was the experience like when you attended mm -hmm. Hopkinton High School and what do you see happening in our schools today? And I feel like this messaging is important because we're in a pivotal time. You know, mm -hmm. our schools are growing exponentially and um, we want to keep them in that place where we are ranked among the top tier schools mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So our earlier graduates are Josh yeah. and Jen, <laughs> yeah. and Connor is a more recent graduate. So I suppose I'll just start by asking you very casually, what was it like when you were in the Hopkinton Public Schools way back in the earlier middle 90s? Well, I graduated with the class of 90, and it was, it was a lot different. I graduated with maybe 70 kids in my class, and that's a time when I took home ec, there was a wood shop, and we had the prom in the gym. And there really weren't a lot of the electives and what I see being offered at the high school now. It was also a time where a lot of kids started leaving mm. and they started going to Holliston or to Marion. That was another choice that some parents were able to make for their kids because they just didn't have the faith in the mm. school system at the time. Mm. I feel like uh, at graduating in 95, I remembered seeing some of that um, early on when I started entering into junior high where a lot of kids would be traveling to faraway places mm -hmm. to take high school classes Mount St. Charles or St. John's in Shrewsbury and of course Marion and, yep. and Halston as well and uh, there was kind of a group of families that seemed to be frustrated with that reality and then there was this group called NEASC who comes along and gives mm -hmm. us accreditation from time to time and they basically said the high school is at risk of losing its accreditation which would devalue its diploma mm -hmm. uh, and so because of that threat there were a lot of folks that kind of decided let's you know begin to look into what is it going to take to get our school to be a place we're proud of to become a place where people are excited to come mm -hmm. um, and so the override that eventually occurred in that like mid 90s like 93 era I think is what really kind of propelled the school I think to take advantage of mm -hmm. all of the new um, community members of course 495 and the tech belt was kind of coming online at the same time particularly with EMC and, mm -hmm. and so I do think there was a bit of like a sweet marriage of a lot of things uh, that allowed the school to take advantage of that enthusiasm but it was really some parents that were willing to say hey look we got to come up with some money make this school a place that we can be proud of and I bet our kids will show us the way and I, I feel personally like sure enough we have you know and the towns continue to double down when necessary over the last 30 years and each time it's paid dividends and, and for the school system in my opinion to be sitting where it does a, a, across the tops of the state which really is the top of the country and that, that would be the it top is. of the world that is because we've invested in it and so I think it started back in in those early 90s where we saw something we didn't like and we made some adjustments and now look where we are today we're so proud but mm -hmm. to your point we're really at a crossroads because our buildings are swamped we are. Uh, the inn is full in my opinion you know mm -hmm. and I think it's time to to kind of look at mm -hmm. what, what can we do to help support our work I think that I'm a grateful recipient of some of the things that happened <laughs> after you guys went to high school. I graduated in 2013, and my class size was 244, but we were in the new building. Wow. Obviously, that was built in 2001, mm -hmm. I believe. So uh, some things that I remember um, compared to now is right now there's an amazing business and tech program that wasn't really in existence when I was there, but obviously that has required space. That mm -hmm. was uh, in the former storage room for some of the film and TV supplies and maybe some of even art supplies. Uh, something else I've noticed that's a little bit different than when I graduated in 2013 is the use of technology. All of the classrooms have been completely 
transformed in the use of projectors and the students have laptops and there's tons of people in the building that are knowledgeable about the use of technology and are mm -hmm. able to share things that we weren't using when I was in high school. But I do feel like the experience, as it sounds, um, is different from the early 90s. It's a lot um, different. I remember the guidance office and walking in and seeing two college pennants. I think there were two state schools. And that was it. Mm. It was a poorly lit room. And really, the future was a little dreary. Mm. But when I dropped my own boys off, who were freshmen at the high school, I walked in and I almost got a tear in my eye because there were just college pennants everywhere, really big schools. I mean, really, whatever you want to do can be made possible through the high school. Yeah. You know? Well, I think, and you know, it's, it's K to 12, and it, and yes, it starts it in the families, and that's what we're talking about tonight is, like, the people of this mm -hmm. community. Like, we know how much they value education, and I don't know how well informed they are about what is happening in our schools right now. Hopefully this acts as a reminder to them of, like, we know you moved here mm -hmm. because you care about school. That's been one consistent thing in the last 30 years here. Parents love their kids. They feed mm -hmm. them. They tell them school's important. They give them great shelter. They send them off. And our teachers are excited, ready to teach and learn with the kids uh, for that full day. And I, and I feel like we're getting to a point where at the high school, it certainly feels like there's so, such a limited space. Our classroom uh, class ratio is growing at a rate that I feel like some of that great, that excellent work that can make some of those college opportunities a reality Absolutely. we're getting to a balance point where that might not be a fair expectation and so i think we need to mm -hmm. make some adjustments to allow for the growth that's occurred here to kind of continue on because you're right this is a great place it, it is uh, i think you know when you look across the state where would you want to raise a family and bring kids through an educational system mm -hmm. this is pretty you know, a pretty special place. And uh, I'd like to continue to think it folks is. want us to support it, even though that's difficult too. I, I get that, like it's money, and mm -hmm. but I feel like it's well, well worth it. We've shown what it can happen. Yeah. Um, and I mean, let's face it, I was awed by the high school because it just looks so different than when I was there in 1990. But I mean, the magic of Hopkinton really does start at Marathon because we lay the foundation. And teaching first grade now is a lot different than it was for me teaching first grade 25 years ago. But um, the, um, the, the technology that we have, the programs that we have are amazing. Mm -hmm. We have, I can't say enough about the first grade team as well as the preschool team and the kindergarten team. I mean, we as teachers are so proud to be teaching in Hopkinton. But it also comes with a pressure as well because, I mean, we want to continue this excellence and this quality of education every single day. The reality is, is that our classrooms at Marathon are at capacity mm -hmm. right now. We really don't have any extra classrooms. My class size is 24 kids. And what keeps me up at night and a lot of other educators up at night at Marathon is you think, I really needed to check in with that kid about math today. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do it. I couldn't see that reading group today. I know this child needs help, but I couldn't get to that child when you have 24 children in a class. I mean, it's, teachers don't want to skim the surface of curriculum. We want to dig deep and give these kids the most solid foundation that we can mm -hmm. so they're prepared to take off when they get to you. Yeah. Right. And I think when we're talking about um, extraordinary numbers of students joining the school district, mm -hmm. what ends up happening is what you're describing. Mm -hmm. So you have 24 kids in a yeah, first grade classroom or you feel like at the high school you're just bursting at the seams and trying to kind of keep a lid on that pot, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So that comes with the cost of more faculty. Yes, it does. But you can't mm -hmm. hire more faculty if you don't have the spaces to put There's them no in. Space. So as Connor mm -hmm. describes, you know, in increasing the offerings at the high school by having a really incredible tech and, and business um, area of the high school. And I think that with technology, because people now have a device in their hands, mm -hmm. we've been able to dismantle what used to be computer labs. So we've been smart about space. But I just keep going back to we have taken in over 500 kids in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Three years ago when Hopkins, for example, opened its doors as a two-grade school, there were about 500 kids in there spread out of a 24 general education classrooms. Mm -hmm. We have 
taken in 500 kids, we haven't added a single classroom space. Mm -hmm. There is not a single additional physical space in our public schools. So I think that's why we're feeling what we're feeling, mm -hmm. and we have that fear of education and its high quality being compromised yeah. at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I've heard this expression bursting at the seams a lot, and I just mm -hmm. noticed or realized that when I came to interview for a job at Hopkinton High School, I talked to the former science department chair, and I said, what are these tables doing in the hallway? What are these, you know, gathering spaces? And it was because we were quite literally bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. The classrooms are flooding into the hallways, whether it's a study hall or it's the library space, or we just needed more space to manage groups of students who wanted to study or who wanted to meet after school. And um, kind of illustrates, I think, that expression of bursting at the seams. There's, there's not enough people, or not enough space for those people in the classrooms, right. whether it's during a study mm -hmm. hall or during a time after school where they need to find a quiet place to work. Yeah, and when you, you think about the historical perspective, right, in the early 90s when there weren't enough kids, everyone mm -hmm. was leaving, mm -hmm. and what did we do? We invested, the community and students rose to the challenge. I remember, um, I think it was in 94, or 92 rather, the girls basketball team made it to the Boston Garden, and that was such a big community builder. It was like it was. a... Um, moment in time that made the community feel like our kids can do it, our school can do it, let's make sure we invest properly. And that sediment was continued through the 90s when there were like three pretty large overrides to, to fund the uh, actual um, operating budget and improve the library as an example, to build the Hopkins School and then to eventually build the high school. And so because they saw what people were willing to do, the community stepped up and, and with the help of EMC and, and the growth that they brought in, it really timed up well. But I feel like it's great that we've had 500 kids join the party in the last mm -hmm. uh, few mm -hmm. years, but we need to make sure that there's enough party hats for them, you know? And so I think that this is an opportunity for us to kind of see what we've done historically. And, and I'll often talk about like, our teaching staff is so talented at the high school. Their, their expertise is unprecedented. And someone asked recently at a meeting, we had um, some ar architects came to look at the high school and to look at some design options for added space. And they were asking questions about like, what are other things you're feeling that leading you to think that the building is too uh, small for right now? And I said, to be honest, I think our staff is such, operates at such a high professional level. We haven't seen what I think would be happening in a lot of other buildings when you have so much sharing of classroom space, so much movement, so many more students. Like everyone is just carrying a little extra. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we're doing it because we have such a high level of professionalism. But I worry about, um, you know, this another year or two years. Will people say, mm -hmm. you know what, there might be other districts that are more um, attractive to me or I'm just burnt out because I know how to do this job at a high level. Mm -hmm. If I'm not given the tools or schedule to, to continue to do it, I, I'm not sure if I can. You know, and I think mm -hmm. that's where the passion of great educators is seen, where, where they get frustrated, not because of things out of their control, just what they know they can do, and now they're not able to do it because there's either too many students or not enough space. Well, we want to be effective yeah. at the end of the day. We want to reach all of these kids, and it's, it's hard to reach 24 children all at once. Right. It's and we difficult. have been effective, right? I mean, we you look been. at some of the MCAS data the last few years, and I mean, it's extraordinary. We have 87% of mm -hmm. students score advanced mm -hmm. in, in, in math or ELA. I mean, those numbers are just like... And it's there because the work of the teachers. Yeah. They're, they're so um, content well versed and then they know exactly what moves to make mm -hmm. around the students. And so as long as we give them great places to do their work, I think it's just going to continue to project in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like we are in a place now where we really need our community to step up. Mm -hmm. We need additional space at the high school. We probably need temporary space while we're figuring out what's going to be happening um, at the elementary level, but that would require temporary classrooms at Elmwood, temporary classrooms at Hopkins, mm -hmm. and maybe in the not so distant future, even temporary Marathon. classrooms at Marathon, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of get us over, to, over that hump. But I think we'll be working with the MSBA and mm -hmm. trying to build either two schools or a very large new school and you know, that will all be shared with school committee on uh, the 14th of November at an upcoming meeting. But I guess I'm kind of wondering from you, uh, what do you think needs to happen in our community? Like what do you think just in terms of sentiment, in terms of feeling, in terms of, I mean, because you've lived through it once I guess, so do you have that sort of, how did it look the first time? When I graduated it was just very dim. I mean, there you graduated just to get out of Hopkinton. 
I mean, I, I want people in Hopkinton to be as proud of Hopkinton as I am of teaching in Hopkinton and living in Hopkinton. I'm proud to send my children to Hopkinton every day. And I want to make sure it's not just my children that I'm helping, it's generations more of children because going back to what it was, it was really a self-defeating sort of feeling being in Hopkinton in you know, 89 or 90. Mm. But everyone rallying together and you know, looking for the good of all children and maintaining our level of ex excellence and not even maintaining that level, let's get better yes. every single year. And I know that we can do it, we just need the tools. And I think what I hear you saying is you sort of adopted an identity because of the quality of mm -hmm. your schools, right? Um, and maybe that's even true when you describe going into a very dim guidance office where there were two pennants and they were both <laughs> state pennants. schools and these were your options, right? Mm -hmm. How do we sort of keep yes. that excitement now alive where kids are, identify, are identifying themselves as graduates of Hopkinton High School? And I know that you have talked a little bit about that, about how at your graduation time you had a really strong sense of self. Yes, I think that um, obviously the graduating class in 2013 um, were recipients of all these great things happening in the district at the time. So um, as class president, I've tried to stay in touch with a lot of the graduates. And um, I know that there are so many students who have felt like they know who their authentic self is by the time they have graduated Hopkinton High School. Or they have a sense of, this is something that I'm passionate about, and this is something that I'm going to pursue because I feel like I have agency and I feel like I have the skill set, the toolbox that I need to mm -hmm. do well in this industry, whatever it might be. It could be a four-year school. It could be moving across country to pursue a career in music. It could be going to a trade school or a two-year associate's degree. But I got the sense when we were graduating in the auditorium that people were optimistic and they mm -hmm. thought, if I wanted to do something, I am completely prepared to do that. And I've seen it um, at reunions or in conversations with graduates when they tell me that they're working for companies or whether they're pursuing an interest in poetry and writing a short story or they're feeling really optimistic about their um, you know, relationships mm. with employers or colleagues. Yeah. They just feel like they know what they're doing and they're enjoying what they're doing. I think the worst thing for something, the worst thing that could happen is people become complacent. Mm. I mean, I live, I grew up in Hopkinton. I graduated from Hopkinton. I left Hopkinton at, at one point. And we came back for my boys to start the eighth grade with a fabulous team at the middle school. And I, I don't think, I think people get used to with being in the system for so long with their children starting here in kindergarten. It, they're just used to how wonderful it is. I don't think people have a sense of how good we are mm. compared to other districts because when I pulled my own kids from a different district and I brought them in, I mean, I just got their MCAS scores. Everything went up. Mm. You know, it really, a quality district really makes a difference. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I think in terms of like the, the question you asked, like what do we need? Uh, in the 90s, we were kind of like our backs were up against it. And so it was like a fight of pride. Like we're better than mm -hmm. what's being represented. And, and come on, we need to prove this. And, and we were able to. Now we've proven it, we've been at the top, and now it's a matter of like, what are we doing to support that and to continue, continue it to, to continue grow, it. you know? And I know for me personally, having studied at different colleges and universities, having taught in different environments, Hopkinton is a unique place. Mm -hmm. It's a special place with caring families and caring educators. And if I were to have the pick of any place to work with in the state, it would be here. And I've obviously I, I grew up here, but I've also experienced other places. We have what it takes, and we just need to kind of continue to grow it. And mm. I think, and like the families here are so talented as well. Their kids are so ready to learn mm -hmm. and grow. And we think about our world's problems and like what we have against us over the next 50 to 70 years. Mm. We need this generation yes, of kids, especially these best and brightest kids, to be well prepared and enthusiastic about taking on those challenges. And, uh, you know, I mean, not to get too dramatic, but I feel like if we don't find a way to properly fund and support their experiences mm -hmm. in their foundational learning, the chances of us solving those problems uh, become smaller because these literally are the smartest kids in some instances mm -hmm. in the entire world in this age bracket. So <laughs> if it's not them that's going to help solve it, I'm not sure who. Yeah. Uh, so it's our time to kind of pitch in and, and make sure we're, we're appropriately um, 
you know, addressing our needs. Yeah. And Connor, I, I was forgot that you were a class president, as, as was I, and I love connecting yeah. with alums yeah. across, the, yeah. uh, across the globe that are leading in many areas and doing amazing things. And, it, it, you know, it all starts here, as the saying goes, and I, I feel like you know, we're, we're, this isn't just hyperbole. We really do have a lot of amazing things being done by we Hopkinton do. grads uh, all over the place. So. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. always impressed to hear what they find themselves doing and really how comfortable they are doing the things that they are doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know. I don't think I knew that the two of you were both class presidents. So. <laughs> 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 that you're both here. Yeah. <laughs> Go if back you, home. If you had just one thing that you could immediately have in your schools, um, just one wish granted, what, what would that be right now? Mm. I would love a K-1 class size of 16 to 18. I mean, we, we're the foundation. We need to produce solid readers, solid writers, solid mathematicians. We, we need smaller class sizes, so we need extra classrooms. We need extra teachers. Right. And yeah. I think, you know, as we project the enrollments at every school committee meeting publicly or when we're here at HCAM or mm -hmm. whatever kind of interviews we're doing, we will always show people what those target class sizes are. Mm -hmm. And when you start to have class sizes of 24 and it should be 18 yes. or 17, you know, you know that Makes those kids difference. are getting a good education, but they're they not are. getting everything they could get. That it, and true. that's frustrating because we want yes. to give them everything. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we love what we do. Yeah. So we want to give them the world. And you all love Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. You do. Because it's your home. Really. It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, similarly, I think in a science classroom, uh, sometimes I'm restricted by lab space. Mm. So right now we have 24 lab stations. And if I'm doing a lab, I can do it fairly easily with 24 lab stations, but only if that class has 24 students. Mm. And um, so my, sometimes my classes will go up to 27, and then I have to kind of makeshift some lab spaces at the front of the classroom where the teacher mm -hmm. desk is. So it's possible, but I also know that it's a lot less safe for my students to be in a classroom of anything greater than 24, the mm -hmm. likelihood of accidents happening goes kind of through the roof um, if there's more than 24 students in the classroom during a lab. And if I'm making my teacher desk a lab station for students, obviously I don't have as much space for the materials that I need to teach. Mm -hmm. So um, if I had to make a wish, it would be just to have enough lab spaces in my classroom for my students, mm -hmm. um, whether that's more lab spaces or smaller classes. But it's probably easier to do smaller classes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, to kind of go off what Connor was saying, I think all of our departments need larger areas of space, particularly our STEAM departments, mm. uh, with technology and engineering and coding being such a part of the work that our students are going to graduate into these industries. And I feel like, based on who our students are, what their families do for work, we can grow that part of our curriculum in a way that would mm -hmm. allow for them to interact at a more consistent level. But I also think like the, the social emotional piece of us trying to address the needs of our students and where they are, how they mm -hmm. feel about themselves, we could afford some more kind of small meeting space. Mm -hmm. So we could really individualize our instruction. Mm -hmm. Right now, the number of spots for us to hold meetings with families and kind of talk mm -hmm. individually about how a young person mm -hmm. is doing, it's so, we're, we're constantly overlapping each other. and. We manage it, like I said earlier, because I feel like there's a lot of like high-level professionals, but that's really that next level of in-depth work about who are you as a learner, what are your interests, how can we match mm -hmm. what we have to what you need, and without enough kind of meeting spaces, those conversations won't happen. They'll, they'll stay online, and we want to invite people in and mm -hmm. get to know at a deeper level, and I think you know, with some creative design, we, we might be able to see that more frequently. But I mean, it is tough to say one area versus another, uh, mm. that, that would be the spots that I think would be most mm. helpful to kind of continue to create a, you know, a great experience. Yeah, and I do agree with you that that need is pervasive. It's everywhere. You know, we talked a little bit about you know, kids really understanding who they are mm. as human beings, and they are not afraid to be poets or to be mathematicians or whatever it is that they want to pursue. But I think that is one of the gifts that Hopkinton Public Schools gives to children. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to come in there and you want to do that's ceramics right. or robotics, that's just as valued as high-level math. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we're only going to be able to continue those services with continued support, both sort of emotional support and financial support. Mm -hmm. and absolutely. I thank the families for the support that they have shown us mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. so. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, yeah. I think we are probably running out of time. All right. And I want to thank you all for being here today and sharing your Hopkinton sort of lives as um, students and as professionals. Yeah. I wish I could do Hopkinton all over again. <laughs> but this one, I want it this round. That'd be great. I'd love to know what it was like in the 90s. Big hair. Big hair. Yeah, a lot of Aquanet. Yeah, a lot of Aquanet going down. Work boots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it clearly was good for the three of you, and I'm sure that yeah. it's been good for countless other students, and every day I'm honored to, to be a part of it. So. Likewise. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thank Carol. Anything right. else you'd like to add? No. All right. Well, thank you thank once you. again. Thanks. And thank you to our audiences. Um, tune in for another episode of Highlights from the Hill. Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get in a $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you. From the outside, it looked like I had it all together. Great education, good job, but inside I was massively insecure. Drinking helped me calm my fears, but I ended up losing everything. When I finally admitted I needed help, I came into Teen Challenge. And as time went on, I didn't feel so insecure. Now my whole world has been rebuilt, and I'm not going to lose it again. Hello. My name is Officer John Corden of the Hopkinton Police Department. I am here to explain some important information regarding opiate overdoses under the Good Samaritan Law, Chapter 94C, Section 34A. First, a person who in good faith seeks medical assistance for someone experiencing a drug-related overdose shall not be charged or prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance. Second, a person who experiences a drug-related overdose and in good faith either seeks medical assistance or other seeking assistance shall not be charged or prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance. Third, the act of seeking medical assistance for someone who is experiencing a drug-related overdose may be used as a mitigating factor in a criminal prosecution under the Controlled Substance Act. Lastly, a person acting in good faith may receive a Narcan prescription and administer it to an individual appearing to be experiencing an opiate-related overdose. For more information, please contact the Hopkinton Police Department or Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Thank you.